This podcast is presented to you by Pastor Derek Armstrong and Word of Grace Community Church. For more information, please visit WOGCC.com. Good morning, everybody. So glad that you're here today. And I'm just really excited about today's message because we're going to be wrapping up our series in Romans. We have been going through the book of Romans. This is our 16th and final week of going through the book of Romans. And I pray that God has just encouraged you. I pray that he's strengthened you. And I pray that he's really helped to establish and solidify the foundation for your faith. Because all throughout this teaching, we've been really hitting home with the gospel. We've been hitting home with our need for Christ. We've been really talking about how even as we as Christians may have different relationships in and outside of the context, of our church family that we still navigate those relationships with mercy and truth and that we allow the love of God to be the guide in our relationships. We talked about keeping unity in the church. We talked about all the different issues that Paul addressed and we talked about how we have gifts and how God wants us to use those gifts and today Paul is kind of wrapping up his letter to the church in Rome and he's really saying a lot of different things here and so we're going to try to encompass all these into one message and the real theme that I found throughout my study of the last couple of uh, chapters in the book of Romans is just authenticity. I just really think that Paul is helping us to see the need for authenticity and how we need to be authentic in our relationship with others. And I think that that's really a direct reflection of our authentic relationship that we have with Christ. So in other words, an authentic relationship with God is going to be reflected in the way that we connect to others. It's authenticity. And I think that's what the world is really looking for. I think that the world has seen the, 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 the idea of what should be and the idea of what could be and they've heard it and they've heard our words and they've heard the church say this and they've heard Christian people say that they're all about this. But I think that the proof is in the pudding. I don't even know what that really means if you think about proof in the pudding. But I think the proof is in the pudding. All right, And I think that it really shows what we believe when we can not only speak it and articulate it, but when we can actually live it and help others to not only see it, but to feel it as well, where they feel that authenticity, where they feel someone genuinely cares about them, when they feel someone genuinely means what they say. And I think that God is calling us to be authentic in our relationship with Him, and that's going to be reflected in our relationship with others. You know, being a disciple of Jesus, it's not a form, it's not a set of rules, it's not a carbon-copied manner of living, but rather it's true, genuine relationship. And I think that's going to bring forth authenticity in every area of our lives. So as we wrap up our series in Romans today, I want to share how the gospel is going to impact our heart. And it's going to reflect the authenticity that I believe that this world is desperate for. So if you have your Bibles, go to Romans chapter 15. That's where we left off last week. We went all the way through verse 13 last week. So we're going to pick up at Romans 15. In verse 14, you can also follow along on the Bible app if you have that as well, if you want to follow along along online, Romans 15 and verse 14 says this, Paul's writing to the church in Rome and he said, now I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you're full of goodness and you're filled with knowledge, able to admonish one another. He said, I'm confident concerning you. He said, I'm confident in the fact that you're full of goodness and that you're filled with knowledge and that that should enable you or give you the ability to admonish one another. And so I think that authentic Christians are called to grow in knowledge of Scripture for the purpose of encouraging or admonishing one another. I think that Paul is trying to help us to see here that the purpose of us growing in our knowledge of Scripture is not just so we can be smarter Christians, right? I think that anything we receive from God, the purpose of it is not just to benefit us and us alone. I think anything that God bestows upon us as a blessing or that he gives us, whether that be in the form of scriptural knowledge, whether that be something that he blesses us with materially, whether that be an attitude or something he develops in us, it's not just for us. But you and I are actually called to be conduits of God's love, mercy, and 
His truth. So when we have this goodness, when we have this knowledge that we've received from the Scripture, when we've received truth, we're not just supposed to use it for our benefit alone. We're supposed to allow those things that we have learned, that we have grown in, to actually flow out of us for the benefit of others. When we do that, we're actually helping the body of Christ to be in unity, and we're sharpening and strengthening one another. This is really the purpose of the church. If you just put your finger there in Romans 15 and flip over to Hebrews chapter 10, we see here where the writer of Hebrews says something very similar in Hebrews 10 and verse 24. He said, let us consider one another and that we stir up love, that we stir up good works, that we not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. He said, listen, we need to stir up love and good works in one another. It's our job to encourage one another to do good works. It's our job to help strengthen and admonish and encourage each other that are Christians here in the family of God and not forsaking to assemble together. That's the purpose of us gathering together. He said, especially when you see the day of the Lord approaching. Have you turned on the TV lately? Have you read the newspaper lately? Man, is the day of the Lord getting closer and closer? I mean, we see how the, the, the media would try to inject fear into society to get us to be afraid, to get us to want to, to, to run away from certain things or run to certain things. But God is saying, listen, just because fear tactics are being spread in the world and you see the day of the Lord approaching, you who are part of the family of God, you don't have to play the game. You don't have to live in fear and worry because you can live in peace in the middle of a storm, in the middle of trials, because you know where your hope and your help comes from if you belong to Jesus. But sometimes we can get goofy in our heads and we can forget those things. You know, we were singing about how Jesus paid it all. And when you really think about Jesus paying it all in light of that, it makes everything else that we deal with and go through in life just kind of fade away. When you think about the purpose of life, when you think about the fact that our, our, our life is wrapped up and secured in Christ, then I think, man, what can man really do unto me? I mean, seriously, what's the worst thing on this planet that could happen to me? You could take my life away from me, sure. But guess what? I would just get to go through the express lane to glory. I would get to be with Jesus forever. What can I? There's nothing for me to fear. So if I understand that my eternity is wrapped up in Christ, then my life here on earth is wrapped up in glorifying Christ, then whatever fear tactics the world may try to spread, whatever things everybody else may be freaking about, freaking out about, or they may be worrying about, or they may be anxious about, or they may be troubled about, we as believers can rest in the finished work of the cross and go, you know what, I'm just still going to keep trusting in Jesus. And as we do, we see how God has always had his hand on his people all throughout Scripture. We see even in one of the worst points of Egyptian uh, history where, where, where they had the children of Israel captive for 400 years. And we see that during all of the different plagues that came upon Egypt, that every time God still preserved and took care of his people as he was leading them out of slavery and captivity. We know that even in the middle of all the junk that we go through, that God is not giving up on us. Amen? But sometimes when we're in this world, we can forget those things. And the Bible says we need to take the knowledge that we have and the goodness and the things that we have that have been given to us, and we actually need to exhort and encourage and sharpen and strengthen one another when we start to get a little wobbly, when we start to get off the path, when we start to get a little down or confused. That's what the church is there for, because the more the day of the Lord uh, is approaching, we begin to see the escalation of sin in the world. We begin to see the escalation of the effects of sin in the world. We begin to see the pressures from sin in the world. And the more we see that, the more that the church should should just really strengthen and exhort and sharpen and encourage one another. And that's what Paul's saying. Hey, you guys, I'm confident concerning you that you're full of these things. And so you need to use those things to admonish one another. Let's keep on reading verse 15 and 16. Nevertheless, brethren, I've written more boldly to you on some points as reminding you because of the grace given to me by God that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles ministering the gospel of God that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanct- excuse me, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In verse 15, he said, I've written some things to you that have been pretty bold. As we've went through this study, man, Paul said some pretty bold things. 
to these people. First of all, he's never met these people before. He's never been to the church at Rome. So Paul is writing some pretty bold things to some people that he's never met before because he said, because I'm concerned about you, because I understand where you're at. And so I'm saying some things to you that may be bold. And I think that that's reflective of authentic Christians because authentic Christians are called to be honest and they're called to be bold in their relationships. We need to be bold. We need to be honest, especially concerning speaking the truth in love. Saying things that aren't easy to say. We need to be reminded of the truth, even if it's uncomfortable and it requires boldness on our end. I think that when we genuinely love somebody, I mean, when we really care about somebody, we will confront and speak the truth in love. Because love is not all about just being passive and whatever happens, happens. That's not love. Actually, if, if, if we look at all of our relationships and, 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 and we see someone that's beginning to, to, to stray or to go in error or that someone has offended us or someone that has wronged us and we don't bring that to them in a God-honoring way, then what we're actually doing is we're just being passive and we're being selfish. Because if we're not willing to speak the truth in love, then we're more interested in self-preservation than we are that person's good. I thank God for people who have spoken boldly and said things in my life when they did it in love and concern to help me to grow in different areas. And we as Christians are called to do that. I think that sometimes people have this idea that Christians are just supposed to let everybody on the planet just run over them, and that's not the case. Amen? Amen. I think that people have this idea that Christians are just supposed to all be soft-spoken. They're all just supposed to be kind. And if you're that person, I love you, and I think you're awesome. If you're that soft-spoken person, but that's not how everybody has to be. And this is the what a Christian has to do. No, we need to stand up for what is right, amen? And we need to help others who we have relationship with, who God has granted us influence with, especially those that are closest to us. If, if, if they've offended us, if they've hurt us, or if they're going somewhere that they shouldn't go and they're getting involved in things they shouldn't get involved in that are going to be a detriment to them, that are going to hurt them, we need to speak the truth in love. And we need to help them during those times. And Paul said, I said some pretty bold things, but I said it with the motive of love. I said it with the motive of helping you because an authentic Christian, someone who's really reflecting a genuine relationship with Christ is going to be someone who can be honest and bold in relationship. And that's something that God wants us to grow in because selfishness and self-preservation will destroy, will divide, and will create bitterness. In other words, if someone has offended you or if someone has wronged you or if you see someone going in in, in a wrong direction that you have relationship with and you decide to keep silent on the issue, then you're allowing your mind and your heart to be the devil's playground. Because you're going to go find someone who's going to agree with you about your offense and then that person's going to jump on the bandwagon and they're going to be mad at somebody that they may have never even met before in their life because you're sharing your offense with them. It's not like sharing your fries at McDonald's. It's like, here's my offense, now why don't you be offended with me so we can both just be mad and offended together? You see, authentic Christians, they'll, they'll be honest and speak the truth. Hey, this hurt me. Hey, this, I, I, I just want to confess this before you. Or hey, this, this situation or that situation. And we want to keep that honesty there. Because when we're passive about it, we allow our hearts and our minds to be the devil's playground. And when we try to accumulate or assemble people around us, who will share our offense with us, then we're not going to produce anything good out of that relationship. Let me give you this word of caution. If you have friends that the sole reason that you're friends with them is because of the things that you can sit around and gripe about, you need to find some new friends. Mm -hmm. All right. So, anyways, Paul is trying to help us to see, hey, I said some bold things to you, but I said them because I love you. All right? I said them because I love you, and I said them in a way that would honor God. Even when, I'm not saying this isn't your license to go be a jerk, okay? This isn't your license to go out and just, just rip people, you know, all to shreds. No, this is, this is saying, hey, I need to speak the truth in love. I need to do it with love being my motive. And if I can't do it in love, then I need to slow down and get my heart right before I speak to someone, amen? If I'm in the moment, I need to settle myself down and make sure that I'm speaking to them in a way that would be navigated by true concern and not just me wanting to be right. And that's important. We need to understand that. So Paul is saying, hey, we need to navigate our relationships with honesty and boldness, especially our relationships concerning the family of God in the church. Because when we don't, we open the door for the enemy to spread discord and divide us. That's what happens. 
when people aren't honest, when they don't speak the truth in love. So honesty and boldness is huge. So let's keep on reading, verse 17 through 21. Therefore, I have reason to glory in Christ Jesus for the things that pertain to God. For I, not, for I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me in word and deed to make the Gentiles obedient, in mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about to Elycrium I have fully preached the gospel of Christ, and so I have made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. But it is written... To whom he was not announced, they shall see, and those who have not heard shall understand. Authentic Christians are called to make a name for Jesus Christ, not themselves. Amen, somebody. We're called to make a name for Jesus Christ. Paul made it his aim to point others to Jesus instead of drawing them to himself. Be wary of church leaders or, or people in your life that would try to draw you to themselves instead of pointing you to Jesus. Because the, the goal is Jesus, right? Not some type of celebrity mentality. It is Jesus. A church, a small group, or a ministry should never be about an individual. It should be pointing people to Jesus. Amen? And Paul is saying, listen, I want you to know... I did not come to Rome before. You guys wonder why Paul waited so long to come to Rome. He said, I didn't come here because I didn't want to build on another man's foundation. In other words, I didn't want to use the celebrity of my name being Paul and everyone knew my story so that everyone would abandon the churches there so that they would come just because Paul was here. He said, I wanted to point people to Jesus so I delayed so I wouldn't be building on another man's foundation. That's what he's saying here. And I think for us to be authentic, we understand that unity in the body of Christ is the goal. And we are called to make a name for Jesus Christ in our lives. So if we're trying to build a name for ourselves where people think we're something special, even us as individuals, as Christians, even if you're not in leadership, even if you're just uh, someone who is following Christ to the best of your ability, we're still not called to make a name for ourselves. That's not the goal. The goal is to point people to Jesus. Always, always, always. Amen? And so we need to understand this thing is about Jesus Christ. And that's huge. We need to get that today. Romans 15, we're going to read 22 through 28 now. For this reason, I also have been much hindered from coming to you, but now no longer having a place in these parts and desiring these many years to come to you when I journey to Spain, I'm going to come to you for I hope to see you on my journey and to be helped on my way there by you if first I may enjoy your company for a while. But now I'm going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. For it pleased those from Macedonia to Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. It pleased them indeed, and they are their debtors. For if the Gentiles have been partakers of spiritual things, then their duty is also to minister to them in material things. Therefore, when I have performed this and I have sealed to them this fruit, I shall go by you in the way of Spain. And here Paul, I believe, is showing us that authentic Christians are called to be generous with what God has given them. He's saying, listen, I'm coming your way, but at first I'm going to make a pit stop because the, the, the saints in Jerusalem had received an offering and I want to make sure that they get that. They've entrusted me with this and I want to make sure that they get that because they minister to them spiritually and we want to minister to their physical material needs as well. And you guys need to understand the heart of generosity. And Paul's trying to help them see how the other churches were generous. Verse 27 said that the Gentiles had been partakers of spiritual things that were presented to them and that it honors God when the needs of those ministering were met. Now, Paul here, I believe truly he's emphasizing a heart of generosity because a heart of generosity is not focused on material things, but rather laying up treasure in heaven. You see, when we think about God uh, in, in this context, we think, you know, there's nothing in this world, nothing in this world that should have my heart more than Jesus. Amen? Nothing. If it does, then it becomes an idol in my life. I had a buddy of mine who was very wealthy. He didn't start out that way, though. My buddy Donnie back in Oklahoma, where I was a youth pastor at, he was a member of our church and a friend of mine. He was about 20 years older than me, but we went to lunch every Tuesday, Donnie and I did. Donnie started off living in a two-bedroom um, mobile home that he and his wife paid $5,000 for, and they lived in for a long time, and he was working at an uh, airplane turbine refurbishing company. So when the turbines on the airplane engines would wear out, 
they would get sent to this company and they would refurbish them and send them back. And Donnie got the idea one day that, you know what, I could do this better than the company I'm working for. And so he did. He started a little company out of a garage in his, uh, right behind his home in a little shop. He started his own company. And now the company grew and became a multi-million dollar company because he did it so well and he did it so much better than the other company. Ran his former employer out of business based on the fact that he did it so well. And then, now Donnie lives in a beautiful 5,000 square foot home that he built himself. And matter of fact, he has one of those gate things with his initials on it that whenever you push a button, it goes, you know, and you're like, oh. And, and, and Donnie, um, then, after he got the turbine business going real well, he decided that he would start building homes. So he built his home first and learned how to build homes. So he decided to start his own contracting business where he began to build homes. Then he got tired of giving realtors their percentage of the sale of the home. So he learned how to be a realtor, got his license, and built homes and sold homes and ran his turbine business. Then he got bored with that and sold that business and decided to go into trucking and bought a trucking company and started his own trucking company, and, and which is still going to this day. And God just really blessed him. And so Donnie had this truck. And you can imagine a guy that is that successful in life, the kind of truck this guy would have, right? This is one of those trucks. It's like Southern Redneck truck, but it's nice Redneck, you know? It's like, like you've got to step up like on this big, huge ladder to get up in Donnie's truck. I mean, you're like riding in a monster truck or something, you know? He loved his big sound system. He loved his tinted windows. He loved everything in black. His whole truck was just blacked out. I mean, and it was cool riding with Donnie in his truck. I always loved doing that. We would always go out for Chinese food every Tuesday, and Donnie always made me pay for some reason. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but anyways, I, I always bought because I, I ate with him in order to just learn from him because he was a great mentor in my life, still is a good friend of mine today. But Donnie told me one day that uh, we weren't going to be riding in the black truck anymore. We weren't going to be riding in the fancy black truck that he had all decked out and all personalized. He said that God told him that he didn't want anything to have his heart more than him. And he was driving down the road and he saw a little uh, blue 1960-something truck. You know, I think it was the Barely Crank uh, brand. Um, You know those kind of cars, the Barely Cranks? Uh, That's what it was. And uh, so he saw it on the side of the road in a for sale sign in it that said $2,000. And Donnie said the Lord spoke to him and told him, you're going to drive that truck for the next two years and you're going to get rid of your truck. So he sold his truck, he sold his boat, he sold his four-wheeler, all these things he sold and humbled himself to drive that truck for two years. And so now when I went with Donnie, it wasn't quite as fun. <laughs> you know, the ride to the restaurant wasn't as fun as it used to be. And I'll just be honest. But I thank God for people like that in my life modeling that kind of authentic Christianity to me because it showed me that, you know, it really is about our hearts being in the right place. And God knows that money is directly connected to our hearts. And if we allow things to take place in our hearts where God has supposed to have the seat and supposed to have the throne, then we're worshiping an idol. And does God bless us through our obedience and giving to Him? Absolutely. God blesses us sometimes financially. Sometimes He blesses us with material things. But we can't dictate what God blesses us with, how He blesses us with Our job is just to trust him and say, God, I'm not going to let this money or this stuff become an idol. So I always want to make sure that my heart is generous before you and before others. That's authentic Christianity that glorifies God. Amen? You see, if we just pursue things and we pursue stuff, and that's our goal and that's our aim and that's our ambition, then what differentiates us from the world that doesn't know Christ? Because if we're willing to just go cutthroat just to get stuff, then what are we doing? We're trying to build a name for ourselves. And God said, no, I'm trying to work a heart of generosity in you because God knows if he works a heart of generosity in us through asking us to give, through asking us to be faithful in giving through tithes and offerings and through other things that he may lay on our hearts to give. And we know that if we're faithful in that, that he's going to work something in us that's going to bring glory to him, that's going to actually draw people to Christ. And so that's what Paul is saying, that we're called to be generous with what God has given us. You remember, um, maybe if you've read in the book of Acts where it talked about the early church and how they had, they sold all their possessions and they had all things in common. Some people want to get a little weird with that and say, we should all do that. I don't think we should all do that. That wasn't necessarily a command as much as it was something that that church has decided to do. They sold everything they had and they sold all their possessions so nobody would have lack, so that they would all be taken care of because they wanted one another to understand they supported each other and they were not all about their stuff. 
And I think that God doesn't want us to be all about our stuff, especially in the time and season that we're in right now. We're thinking about stuff. We're thinking about long lines at the store. We're thinking about crazy weekend shopping. People are thinking about stuff. God says, don't let stuff have your heart. You know what? I, I kind of go by this rule in my house. Somebody likes something, I tell them it's for sale. I have nothing in my home that I couldn't live without. And I want to make sure my heart stays that way. Regardless of how successful I become or how wealthy I become, I don't want anything in my home to have my heart so much that I can't live without it. The most precious things in my home are my family, not my things. Amen? So a quick way to say it would just say, don't let your possessions possess you. And the best way to do that is by allowing God to develop a heart of generosity in you. And he challenges us different ways all throughout the Bible that he wants us to follow him and trust him and be obedient through giving. And so that really helps us to understand that to further God's kingdom and to do a work in us that glorifies God and shows his character to the world through our lives. Let's keep on reading. Romans 5 and verse 29. And we're going to read through verse 33 here. But I know that when I come to you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. Now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the Spirit, that you would strive together with me in prayers to God for me, that I might be delivered from those in Judea who don't believe, and that my service for Jerusalem would be acceptable to the saints, that I may come to you with joy by the will of God, and I may be refreshed together with you. Now the God of all peace be with you. Amen. Here we see that Paul asked the church in Rome to be striving together in prayer with Paul. He said, I want you to pray with me. I want you to pray for me. I want you to keep unity in prayer because authentic Christians are called to be people of prayer. Amen? We are called to be people of prayer. Verse 30 said we should strive together in unity because Paul knows it, Jesus knows it, they've taught it, they've they've spoken it over and over again that the church is more powerful when they're unified on the things that they're called to do. Now, if we're more unified in an area of building relationships, we're going to be stronger. If we're unified in purpose, we're going to be stronger. If we're unified in our generosity, we're going to be stronger. If we're unified in our prayer, we are going to be stronger than any of us would be individually. And God knows that, and He wants the body of Christ to operate together in unity. And so Paul is saying, listen, I want you to get something here. That prayer in unity is what we need for us to move forward and be the people of God that we've called to be, that we should strive together. So what we're going to do here at Word of Grace is we're putting together some really intentional prayer initiatives that we're going to roll out at the first of the year to really help bring our church together and pray and to be a church that is a church of prayer. Because Jesus said that this is my Father's house and it's to be called a house of prayer. Amen? And we want to be that kind of church that puts an important emphasis on prayer because that's what we, growing as disciples, as authentic Christians, growing in relationship with God, have to understand the power of prayer and the power of prayer in unity together with the church. Let's keep on reading Romans 16. We're going to read 1 all the way through 16. And I'm going to preface this because if you are expecting a child and you do not know what you want to name your child, I'm about to read off 40 or 50 different names because Paul is about to give shout outs and props to all of his buddies. And we got some names in here that are good Greek names, good strong Greek names, good strong Hebrew names. And so if you are looking for a name or if you have a relative or friend that's looking for a name, here's some good ones you might want to throw out. Verse 1, I commend you, Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the church in Sincerea, that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints and assist her in whatever business she has for you, for she indeed has been a helper of many and of myself also. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risk their own necks for my life. To whom I not only give thanks, but I also give thanks in the churches of all the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Greet my beloved Epinetus, who is the firstfruit of Achaia to Christ. Greet Mary, who labored much for us. Greet Androdnachius and Junia, who are my countrymen. I am, I, I, I'm sorry if, if their mothers are in heaven and they are listening to me preach this sermon. I'm sorry for jacking up your sweet little baby's names. I'm sure they were wonderful people. My countrymen and fellow prisoners who were, uh, who were note among the apostles who were in Christ before me. Greet Amplius, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, 
our fellow worker in Christ, and Statius, my beloved. Greet Apelles, approved in Christ. Greet those who are of the household of Aristobulus. I like that. It sounds like a restaurant, like a really nice Italian restaurant. <laughs> hey, where you guys want to eat? I don't know. I'm thinking of Strobulus. Yeah, that's good. All right, greet Herodian, my countrymen. Greet those who are in the household of Narcissus. I guess he thought a lot of himself, who are in the Lord. Greet Tryphena and Tryphosa, who have labored in the Lord. Greet the beloved Persis, who labored much in the Lord. Greet Rufus, there you go, chosen in the Lord and his mother and mine. Greet Asinacritus and Phlegon and Hermas and Petrobus and Hermes and the brothers who are with them. Greet Philologus and Julia. <laughs> And Nereus and his sister Olympus and all the saints who are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ greet you. Whew, hang on. All right, thank you. Um, oh, all right. So, as I read this, I began to think, okay, man, that, that, was, that was pretty tough. There's a lot of names there that we just went through. And he's thanking people. He's giving shout-outs to all these people. And he's saying, hey, this guy was with me in prison. I want to say... You guys greet him, love on him. This is a dear brother of mine. This person was a Christian before me, and they really helped me a lot in life. I want you to greet them. These people actually were in prison together with me. These people actually helped me deliver, be delivered from uh, from the hand of my enemy. So I want you to say hello to them. There's a few other people that I want to say thanks to because they've been workers with me in this thing. And so as I'm looking at this text, and I believe that every scripture that is given is inspired by the Holy Spirit here in the Word of God that you and I have today. And if I believe that, and I believe all the Word of God that has been given to us has a purpose, then I go, okay, what is the purpose of this, God? What can we gleam out of this today in our time? Because we're not the church at Rome, so what can we gather from this that your Holy Spirit would want to share with us today? And the big thing that I got out of this was that authentic Christians give honor and love to one another. You know, it's not a bad thing to give honor to someone who is serving faithfully or to someone that has made an impact on your life. It's actually honoring what God is doing in them and through them. Amen? It's actually us saying, you know what, I really appreciate you allowing yourself to be used by the Lord. I really appreciate the fact that God is doing this through you. And I think that a genuine appreciation of one another in the body of Christ should be expressed regularly to encourage and strengthen the church. So if you see someone that's serving faithfully here in our local church, or if they have blessed you, tell them. Encourage someone. I would challenge you, encourage someone today before you leave. Thank you so much for being so faithful. Every time I see you greeting at the door, man, you're just such a blessing to me every time. Thank you for watching my child. And, 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 and every time that you're here, I, 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 man, you're just always here and always so faithful. Thank you so much for doing it. Thank you for making coffee. We have free coffee. That's awesome, okay? We love the free coffee, but guess what? The people who make it, they do it for free. They do it out of their heart because they love the church and they love you and they want to serve you. Tell them, thank you for being so faithful and you always have a smile on your face or whatever. Just bless them and let them know how encouraged you are. What about our people back here who run our sound and who run our our words and our lights? Nobody even knows they're back there until something goes wrong. Then all of a sudden, everybody wants to turn around and look at them because you looking at them helps them to know that something's not working. So it's all like, you know, this, the microphone starts going, everybody goes, oh, well, hey, I want you to know, buddy. Yeah. He knows it's not working right. You don't have to look around and tell him. He gets it. But what about all the times that it goes smoothly and we never say anything? What about all the times that, 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 that there are no hiccups or issues with those things and everything went actually really well and hit the mark the way they practiced it and the way they showed up early to run through it and made sure, do we tell them thank you? I mean, authentic Christians, I believe, should give honor and love to each other, especially when it's people who are serving us, people who are, I, I thank God for our volunteers. I thank God for people who are willing to stand at a kiosk and check children in to make sure that our children's ministry is secure. I thank God for people who are willing to be a hub of information out at our guest services. I thank God for people who are willing to come and make coffee and then clean up all that stuff afterwards. I even thank God for the people here at our church who are paid to do what they do. I mean, just because they're paid doesn't mean that we shouldn't thank them either, right? We should thank them as well. They're serving. Thank them for doing that, even though they do get compensated. Thank God for people who clean our church. Thank God for people who teach the Word of God. Thank God for people who are willing to sit in our children's classes and prepare things for them. And give. thank God for people who are willing to usher and, and, and to be here and serve and make sure that that part of the service flows smoothly and goes well. Thank God for people who are willing to pray. 
Thank God for people who are willing to come up here during the week and practice music so in order that we would have uh, music here at Word of Grace and that we would know what we're doing. Thank God for all these things. Thank God for people who change out light bulbs. Amen? Because if they didn't, we would begin to notice after a little while. Maybe not at first, when the first two or three bulbs went out, but eventually, yes, we would notice. So thank God somebody does that. Does that person know that we're thankful to them? When we see those people, has, I see people in this church all the time after service is over. Someone will be back in the corner and someone will have tears and I see someone just grab somebody and just hug them or pray with them or someone sitting with someone after church and just sharing their heart with them. Thank God for those people. Tell them, you know what, thank you for always being willing and always being available. Thank you for hearing me. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you for helping me get my, 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 my feet back under me. Thank you. We need to love and admonish one another because when we do, you want to know what it does? It creates this, this, this atmosphere and this culture of appreciation and thankfulness and love instead of this attitude of expectancy that I think that everyone should just do these things just because. It creates grateful hearts in us. You see what I'm saying? And that's why I think what Paul was doing here with his long list is that he realized, you know, me going to Rome and me doing what I've done, I didn't do it by myself. <laughs> I didn't get where I'm going by myself. And I think me as a pastor of this church, I realize I'm doing what I'm doing and I, and I can't do it by myself. This would be a sad, sad thing if I did all this by myself. I've been in churches before where I felt like I was doing everything by myself. <laughs> but I don't feel that here because I feel support, I feel love, I feel encouragement, I feel strength. And, and we need to strengthen one another because it's all not about one person, amen? It's about us working together to accomplish what God has called us to. So make sure we're giving honor and loving one another. So I would challenge you, encourage somebody before you leave today. Let's read on. Romans uh, 16 and verse 17. We're going to read through verse 19. Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned, and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by smooth words and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the simple. For your obedience has become known to all. Therefore, I'm glad on your behalf, but I want you to be wise in what is good, and I want you to be simple in what is concerning evil. What can we glean from this? That authentic Christians strive to keep unity. If we're authentically serving Jesus Christ, our goal should be unity, not strife or division or discord. Amen? And here Paul says, listen, if people are consistently being negative and trying to uh, cause strife or cause divisions in the church, Paul says, avoid those people. He said, when someone of influence tries to flatter you or tries to deceive your heart to partake in their negativity, he gives you this great spiritual truth, this deep doctrinal thing that he calls us to do. Run. That's what he said. He said, avoid them. He said, run from that because God understands that preserving unity in the body of Christ is more important than anyone else's agenda that they would try to throw at you to cause division in the body of Christ. So if someone comes to you and tries to put you against someone else by telling you how, you know, they really don't appreciate you like I appreciate you. They don't really love you like I love you. We love you. They really don't love you. If someone's doing that, then they are trying to cause strife and division and they're trying to flatter you to build an army unto themselves so that you will follow them and that's making something about man and not pointing it to Jesus. Amen? And we need to understand that authentic Christians are not going to do that. God doesn't want us to do that or participate in it. He wants us to be called to strive together to preserve unity. You see, most of the time, these people, what they're really trying to do is they're really trying to get you to take on their offense. They're offended, and they want you to be offended with them. And so they try to put others down in order to make themselves look better so you'll be offended at the people they're offended at so you can all just sit around and all be offended together. Sounds like a lot of fun, doesn't it? It does if you like Jerry Springer. And good (laughs) Lord, I hope you don't. If all you want to do is just have have a bunch of drama all the time, have a bunch of conflict and strife, and let me tell you this, and this is why I say to guard against us and to be careful, because I absolutely love this church. I have been the pastor of this church going on three years now. It was three years ago this Sunday that I came to this church to preach to you for the very first time. Three years ago this Sunday. 
And I am more excited and focused and planted and rooted here than I ever have been before. I am more genuinely passionate about what God is doing in our church than ever before, and I'll tell you why. Because God has shown me where we need to go, and I see it clearly. You know when you first come somewhere, you're really just the leader or the pastor by title only. You don't have a lot of coin invested with the people. The people don't really know you. Well, we've been through some things together, church, in this three years. Good things and not so good things. And I believe that where we're at now, I see I see the fruit of what's beginning to happen and what God is having us invest in and do. I'm seeing the unity that our church leadership has. I'm seeing how we genuinely get along and like each other and and, and can link arms and link hearts together. And I'm seeing how we're all on the same page concerning where God wants us to go as a church. I'm beginning to see how people are getting certain things in the church where they're saying, I get this and I get that and they're growing in the word. I'm getting to see how God is doing things in our church to where you can just see the unity and the love and the relationship and how people want to be connected with each other now. And it's a beautiful thing to see. And I've seen this process happen in this past three years that I've been here. And now where we're at now is so special to me. And it's so good. Is everything perfect at Word of Grace? No, it's not. And it's never going to be perfect. And if you're here because you want it to be perfect, then you're never going to be happy. Because it's not about making it perfect. It's about us growing together as people who are sharpening each other through caring about one another, through spurring one another on to good works, to being those authentic Christians that God has called us to be who are growing in loving God and loving people and serving the world. It's about us growing together as this church family that we talk about all the time. And as I see this happening, I'm not foolish to think that the enemy wouldn't look at all of the good things happening in our church family and all the good things that we know that are happening here that the enemy wouldn't try to weasel his way in or that he would try to slip in through this crack or that crack to cause offense or to cause someone to be upset about something and then they just sit on it and then they allow themselves to really uh, uh, begin to get more and more uh, angry about that and then share offenses. That's why I'm preaching the things that I'm preaching because where we're at now as a church is too precious and it's too important for us to allow the enemy to come in and try to sow discord or division. So what I'm asking you to do through this message is for us to agree together that what we have as a church is precious and is important and we need to protect it through being people of the Word. Amen? We need to protect what God is doing here at our church instead of allowing the enemy to try to weasel his way and come in through negativity, to come in through trying to flatter someone, to pit them against someone else, to try to, to try to drag out a bunch of drama and things like that that will hurt the body of Christ and that will hurt people that we're on guard and that we try to do things to the best of our ability here as a church. That's why we're talking about the things that we're talking about because you hear God over and over again throughout Scripture reemphasizing unity. Re-emphasizing unity. You hear Jesus re-emphasizing unity. You hear Paul re-emphasizing unity over and over again. Because Jesus said to himself, a house divided won't stand. A house divided will not stand. And I think that we are a church now that, that, that is really experiencing some foundational things of community and, and, and unity and, and, and a fresh breath of air in some areas in our church that God is just really doing some special things. And I think those things are only going to continue but we need to strive together to keep unity. Amen? I think that that's huge. I think that authentic Christianity is going to glorify God through working towards one another's good. We're working for the other person's good, not just our own good and our own benefit. Amen? To where we're serving one another with no strings attached, we're preserving unity, not causing division, not causing confusion, because God is not the author of confusion, but the author of peace. And when I see good things going, I get excited about those things. But at the same time, I begin to go, I know the enemy would love to jump in and try to cause offense or try to cause unforgiveness or bitterness or whatever the case may be. But we're not going to play that game because we're people of the Word who understand that God's way is going to be better than the way our flesh would try to lead us. Amen? God's way of us navigating church together and us doing life together and us growing together as a church is going to be better than anything that our flesh would try to lead us. So I'm not interested as much in being right as I am wanting to be where God wants me to be and connected with His plan and His will for my life. Amen? And if I'm there, then I have to stay the course. 
And I have to do what God is calling me to do and strive to keep unity. Let's keep on reading, verse 20 through 27. And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Timothy, my fellow worker, and Lucius, Jason, Sosipater, uh, my countrymen, greet you. Sosipater? Seriously? Okay. So, <laughs> and then I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, greet you in the Lord. In case you didn't know, Tertius was the guy who was actually penning the letter uh, to the church in Rome. Paul was just uh, speaking it as uh, Tertius was writing it down. Um, that would be really helpful uh, for you uh, high school and college students when you're writing term papers, right? So, <laughs> uh, um, Gaius, my host, the host of the whole church, greets you. Um, Erastus, the treasurer of the city, greets you. And, Qu- and Quartus, a brother, the grace of our Lord Christ Jesus be with you all. Amen. Verse 25, now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, kept secret since the world began, but now made manifest and by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations, according to the commandment of the everlasting God for obedience to the faith. To God alone, wise, be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. You see, I believe Paul here in his final remarks, helping us to see this morning that authentic Christianity glorifies God through defeating the work of Satan through spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ, and through bringing unity to his church. If we look at the thread that goes throughout the entire book of Romans, we'll see that it's the gospel. The gospel that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It's that we never stop needing Jesus, and that the message of the gospel is the unifying message for the church to bring to the world, because the world is looking for authentic Christians. The world has seen the selfish agenda of people who claim Christ, but they're looking for someone real, looking for someone genuine. I've always said that I want the mark of my life, and you've heard me say this, I want the mark of my life to be that when my kids are grown and they're out of my home, sometimes, anyways, uh, when they're grown and they're out of my home and they're living life with their families that they have found spouses and children and all that of their own that God has blessed them with, that I want them to be able to genuinely and honestly say that the person that they knew and grew up with and saw behind closed doors was the same person that you guys see as the pastor of this church. And I've always said that's what the legacy that I want to pass down to my children is one of genuine people who are authentic, who are real. So we're not trying to be anybody other than who we are. And we're trying to grow to be more like Jesus. Amen? to be conformed into the image of God's Son. That's what we're doing. We're growing as disciples of Christ. And that's what Jesus has called us to do, to go into all the world and make disciples. Authentic Christianity is the fruit of an authentic relationship with Jesus. So what I want to ask you this morning before we go, do you have that? Do you have that authentic relationship with Jesus? Do you have that relationship with Him? I I don't mean just a head relationship with Him. I mean a genuine relationship with Him. Not where you can just say, I know a lot about Him, but I actually know Him. I talk to Him. I spend time with Him. I have a real, authentic relationship with Jesus Christ because the more I grow in my authentic relationship with Christ, the more fruit that life is going to produce of authenticity, the more it's going to reflect that real, genuine, authentic life of Christ doing a work in my heart. You see, it simply means this. It doesn't mean that everything's going to be perfect. Authentic doesn't mean perfection. Authentic just means that I want Jesus more than I want that other junk. It has no substance. It means that I'm growing in authenticity. The things that I gave you today weren't a checklist, but rather fruit that should come out of a growing relationship with Christ, that we should strive to want to grow in those areas because of our relationship with Christ, because we see the need for growing in those areas. And we know the areas that we're weaker in, that God is saying, it's time for you to step up and and begin to grow in these areas and let me work on your heart in these areas. You see, as we grow in that real relationship with Christ, we grow in knowing Him more and more, it's going to be a greater testimony to the world of the glory of God. Amen? Thank you for listening. For more information, please visit wogcc.com.